Hey, it's me, God's comic Brad Stein. This is Brad Stein Has Issues Where Comedy, Conservatism, and Christianity Collide in a Cacophony of Clarity. And boy, do we have a guest tonight. His name, Dan Biddle. What is he all about? Evolutionary frauds and counterfeits. He literally is talking about fraudulent uh, use of trying to prove evolutionary theory through fake and counterfeit and fraudulent um, specimens. So it's going to be interesting. You may agree, you may not. You might find it fascinating, you may not. But you know what is fascinating? My son, Wyatt Leroy Stein, he wouldn't exist except he exuded from my loins. Wyatt, how are you, son? Doing great, doing great. We just, we just had Resurrection Sunday. Some people call it Easter. Some people freak out over that because they believe they're actually worshiping Ishtar, not, not naming names. But others call it Resurrection Day. Either way, it's the representation of the great, it was just yesterday, son, the greatest day in human history. God Almighty dimensionalized himself, became one of us, died for his creation. Instead of just wiping us out and starting over, he said, I'm going to stick with you guys. I'm going to die for you so you can fall. So it's, it's quite a commitment God made to, to his creation. Would have been easier just to like go, uh, you know, um, let's start over with these knuckleheads. But he didn't. That's love. He committed, he made a, a call, and he stuck with us, and I'm grateful for that. Wyatt, we're talking today uh, with Dan Biddle. Now, have I gone into depth about the Biddle? Not really. You haven't given me the biddle uh, I can't truth. Remember. The biddle truth. truth. I was thinking of a word that rhymed with the biddle, and then I realized halfway through Riddle? they don't really ex- Sniddle? I was thinking piddle. I was thinking of using a made-up word and then just pretending. Little? Yeah, sure. Let's go with little. To be fair, I was trying to think of one that both rhymed and made sense. Yeah. Talking about the little biddle just doesn't really seem like the kind of thing we'd be talking about in this podcast. Quiet. Since when are there any, any okay, limitations? Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I, I, I retract my statement. You're correct. <laughs> I know. So I got to tell you something, though. Tonight's uh, guest is special. Uh, it's Dan Biddle. This entire interview is about evolutionary fraud. So what his, his premise is, is he's done lots of studies, went into... Um, uh, uh, museums uh, around the world did discoveries did, and found there was actual fraud in some of the um, relics. Is that what they call them when you have like a dinosaur head? Fossil? Okay. Uh, I think it's a fossil because a, a relic is sort of more broad. There's a couple of things I knew to, to tell you guys before we bring Dan Biddle. If you are in Virginia, uh, specifically Virginia Beach, on the 20th of this month. Why? That's only 19 days from now, so quit complaining. Dang it, Wyatt. Anyways, uh, what I want you to do is show up because I'm going to be at the FFX Theater, and we are going to be shooting Laugh While It's Legal, the next album, or at least a, an equivalent of the next album, for my special. It will air exclusively, this particular one, uh, on a Good View Network, Secondly, about the militia of the mind, to join us, I'm looking for the mighty 10, 10,000 people who identify as Christians. You can be anywhere in this, in the world, but it is, I'm fighting for the territory that I inhabit, which is uh, the United States. And that's $3 a month. So that allows us to start. It's about us learning to see things that matter to us and start sacrificing. We need to learn what it means to be first century church, taking care of each other, praying for each other thinking the best of each other, watching over each other, helping each other, defending each other. This is what I'm doing. This is what the militia of the mind is. Out thinking, out praying, out lasting, out believing the evil that is taking over the world and seeing if God will uh, show mercy on us and give us a third great awakening. That's what the militia of the mind is. It's what the mighty 10,000 is. Go to bradstein.com. Right now, we're going to talk about a man who sought to discover the frauds in evolution used to try to prove there is no God, no creation. It just, you just throw out a bunch of chemicals, give it enough time, magically, humans will appear. Sound like magic? Sure does. Buggle up, because frauds are about to be exposed. Please welcome Dan Biddle. Well, you know, folks, as God's comic, I have an obligation not only to make God laugh, but to provide for you guys the most insightful, amazing, eclectic guests that I can possibly find. They're very expensive. Trust me. 
Uh, some of these guys, prov uh, I have to send cash, others checks. But this guy was interested. He wanted me to send him a handwoven blanket and a rooster. So apparently he's into bartering. Uh, but uh, it is a very interesting guest we have here. Somebody that I'm very fascinated with talking to for many reasons. Uh, but mainly because um, I have had on uh, guests in this genre from different perspectives. And that's really what I'm interested in right now. It's not just what he has to tell us and his insight and certainly his perspective. But, you know, how do we navigate around the fact that what if we have different um, perspectives on a similar subject and how does that work uh as christians as believers as truth seekers because ultimately truth is more important than anything it should trump denominationalism it should trump our our traditions it should trump uh what we're comfortable with As a matter of fact truth should make you uncomfortable at times because that means it will get you back to true north so that's why we're here to discuss uh, a topic that has a lot of importance on many levels, and that's what we will be uh, diving into. But as I always do, I'm going to bring him on and let him describe himself instead of me doing the uh, traditional boring bios. I know I've had many people bring my bio up, and I just basically want to say, just shut up and cut to the chase. It's, it's just, it's not who I am. So I let them dis, uh, uh, define themselves and then off we go. So please welcome my guest uh, with from Genesis Apologetics. I believe that's the name of ministry. And if it's not, he'll let me know and I will repent. But his name is Dan Biddle and he is with us right now. How do you do, my friend Dan? Thanks very much for that introduction. And, and, and it's great to do the, the own bio. Not, not a problem. You're right. Sometimes it just go on with all this elaborate stuff. I'm like, oh gosh, that wasn't quite correct. Or I haven't done that stuff in five years. Exactly. So, well, and it's yeah, funny but because I, uh, the bio often for me anyways, it's pulled off your website, right? And, and it's really just tries to give people a background on things you've done, shows you've been on, whatever yeah. your particular uh, genre is that uh, indicates whether it's an academic, you know, level of, of acumen or, or in my case, as a performance artist, you know, TV shows, print articles and this and that. But it's really more about information yeah. and it goes on and on. You're like, stop. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. They don't care if yeah. they do, if they don't know who Death I am. By this... Vita, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yes. No. So, so, so true. So, yeah, so just the, the brief version is so relevant to our interview today. So I'm the president of Genesis Apologetics. We're a, uh, a faith-based ministry that deals with the creation evolution topic. And I'm the executive producer of the film that's going to be in the theaters on March 20th and 21st called The Ark and the Darkness. It's a biblically accurate um, film and, and movie about, uh, about Noah's flood. And by background and training, I've been in the field of apologetics for about a decade, but but by professional background, I'm a behavioral scientist by training. I have a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology, and I spent about 20 years as a testifying expert in state and federal court cases dealing with evidence, statistics, and research. So that's wow. kind of a, my, my background. So Man, yeah. so I don't even know if I'm going to be able to uh, have a conversation with you. You're going oh, to- Oh, goodness. Uh, you're going to uh, 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 make me look like a, like an idiot, which, by the way, I am, but I usually get paid for it, not, not to be demeaned. Well, listen, uh, th what an interesting – I'm glad that I, I allowed you to introduce yourself, A, because it allows you to tell people the way you want to be seen. But more importantly, it might cut to the chase as to what is really, I think, the, the, the heart of, of your – expertise or at least what got you into the game but a behavioral do you say psychologist or behavioral scientist uh, or what? a behavioral scientist so okay. uh that's the broader field but my niche was what's what's called industrial organizational psychology so it's psychology and research applied to individuals and, and organizations and I was able to use that degree uh, to testify in court cases dealing with statistics and research and research methods and things of, of that nature. So it's kind of a evidence background that I'm, I'm able to bring to the field of apologetics. So, okay. Yeah. So you would uh, 
you would draw, I'm not going to belabor this because that's not what we're going to talk about, but it's interesting. And it, and I'm just trying to make, get a bead on like what you're really good at. So you would what d draw conclusions based on um, what somebody was saying or what they, that they, how they were test testifying about something and, and you could, what you could observe what this was and find flaws in it or find some kind of uh, um I don't know, uh, they weren't being truthful or there is a more of a statistical analysis about a particular yeah. group of people that normally brings a particular point of view to the to the table. Well, just kind of well, help me yeah, understand. Sure. Um, more specifically, uh, it was in, uh, most of my uh, my research and evidence that I would testify about would be in the field of testing and test development and test validation. So sometimes uh, a plaintiff group would bring about a test and say, hey, it's unfair, it's discriminating against my group or it's not based on the job or whatever. And I would use certain research techniques and to gather data and testify about how the test might be anchored to the job using an evidence-based perspective. So that that's one, one example uh, of, of how my background could be used as a, as a testifying practice. So, yeah. So tell me then how that might apply to confirmational bias. Um, mm -hmm. Would there be sort of, because one of the things, and again, folks, we're going to get into what your particular interest and in expertise is for sure. But I think it's really important to kind of, because I feel like this has a, an element of, what I want to discuss with you that goes above and beyond maybe what you're used to being asked questions about. It's a very sure. simple way to ask you the same questions you've answered a thousand times. That doesn't interest me. I'm more interested in finding some nuances or perhaps some other things that make help you to think on your feet because I find it some more interesting conversation uh, yeah. than the same one. Otherwise I can yeah. just go watch the other 50 interviews you've already done. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and, and for me as well, I mean, you know, we get a, a lot of times like a comic, they'll say, so uh, have you always been funny? So were you funny in school? It's like, you know, is that <laughs> that's, that's your lead in because I've heard that a, seriously. You're, yeah. you have a chance to interview somebody that's interesting. You're going to just take the, the basic or uh, uh, stock question and not try to say, I wonder if I can find another angle here. So here's what yeah. I'm interested in. It was probably a question I was going to move forward to you uh, with your, um, with, with the Genesis apologetics. But I, I think it, it's a perfect, a perfect segue into it. It's that I've had, uh, Jason Lyle, Dr. Jason Lyle on, you probably are yeah. friends with him. He's an astrophysicist, a brilliant guy, great yeah. God believing man of God, right? Serves Jesus, wants to uh, honor him by showing how the Bible is the revelation of God almighty on earth, that it is inerrant, that it uh, describes the world as it is and as it's going to be. And, uh, it's a wonderful, um, um, uh, rule book for how humanity works and, and where it's going. I'm a Christ follower since nine. So that matters to me. I've be, obviously have had my shares of ups and downs. That's the journey of a Christian, but, yeah. um, but I care about the Bible and I believe it is God's revelation as is nature as God's revelation as well as another clue mm. that he exists and he's real and tangible right the best yeah. you can get to a tangible transcendent being mm. which is tricky uh but then i interviewed dr hugh ross also an astrophysicist who does not believe in a six thousand year earth uh yeah. and and so forth and then i interviewed dr stephen meyer uh of the intelligent design uh, movement and yeah. so all of these men um i've had some women too so don't don't start saying I'm a sexist. <laughs> I, you know, uh, Nancy Piercy, uh, a philosopher, uh, Nancy Piercy, if I have a hat on and so forth. But I want to start with this maybe, and I, and, and I hope this doesn't get us off track too much. But I, I think it's important because it's something that I've been trying to uh, grasp with guys like you. Um, 
I also know Ken Ham. I'm not good friends with him, but I, I know of him, Answers in Genesis. And here's a man of God who seeks God and wants to honor him the best he can, built this giant ark replica in yeah. Kentucky. I used to perform there. Uh, I, I don't know if you're part of that or connected to that in any way. Um we, we support their, their ministry. They resell our books and okay. we do everything we can to cooperate with them. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. so here we filmed the movie at their location. So oh, yeah. nice, 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 yeah. nice. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Let's start here then. Ken Ham believes in a 6,000 year earth, no evolution, obviously. Hugh Ross, Stephen Wire probably believe in a, I don't know, 10 billion year universe. Um, I don't know how long they believe the earth exists. Probably but similar to the secular timeline, yeah. Yes, right. 13 right. plus billion, yeah. Okay, right. Okay. But here's 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 the problem, or at least the dilemma. I have to believe that these are Christ followers, right? I mean, they believe that Jesus mm. is God, that he died and rose bodily, and he's the only way to heaven. They are trying to defend our faith with science and their particular uh skill set uh in the secular world against a very antagonistic group the materialist scientists the humanist and they're trying to defend our faith now ken ham is doing the same thing and he has a different perspective which doesn't bother me yeah except for one caveat if you don't believe in the six thousand year uh history of of earth and creation you don't believe the bible or you're not a true believer in the full content of the bible as being inerrant and what i'm trying to understand is well is it possible that people simply ha have tried to follow the bible the best they can and they've just reached a different conclusion but that makes them not a believer that's where i'm confused and i'm hoping maybe you can help me understand if you feel that's a an adequate way to to evaluate a, a believer who's reached a different conclusion and if so yeah. just justify it because I, I just try to understand so i don't <clears throat> put words in your mouth i want you to tell me that perspective so i can understand it Certainly. What what a great jump in point, because um, I'll, I'll give you the short answer and then a longer answer. How does that sound? Yeah, whatever. It's your <laughs> so, show, bro. Um, yo, thanks, man. So so what what people believe about the age of the earth as as clearly laid out in chapters like Luke chapter three, Genesis five, Genesis 10, what they believe about the age of the earth is not a salvation issue. It's a growth issue. That's my perspective. So I was saved when I was 11 years old. I was at a junior high camp and I was saved, saved. I mean, I believe it takes God to know God and God rocked me off my horse. It wasn't a super charismatic experience, whatever, but I knew I was, I became born again that night by the old man was passed away. The new man was there. And I it was like opening my eyes for the first time. I had a great clean salvation experience at age 11 came home from camp, parents got divorced, I slid into the world, became a rebel till I was 17, train wreck, you know, rebel on, on, every, on every front. And then I came back to my relationship with Christ and I was about 17, repented, turned around, got cleaned up. And, and I'd like to say I'd been following Christ ever since. In my 20s and 30s, went to seminary. And those seminary professors sat me down as a student and said, look, if you want to believe in the, in the scholarly perspective of the Hebrew in the book of Genesis, Earth has to be young. That's what these scholars were writing about. The six days were real earth rotation days. You can map up all the genealogies. They lead to a, a young earth between six and 8,000 years old. But if you believe in science, earth has to be millions of years old. So you guys go figure it out. That was the message I got in seminary. It was two things. You know, earth is young according to the Bible, but science is really sure that it's old. So you guys go deal with that. And that put me into a place of cognitive dissonance. It's a fancy word that a psychologist like to use when your, your friction is burning in your mind about how can this be true and this be true all at the same time? This is crazy. What's going on? And so I just punted on the topic, raised my first two kids. Well, well honey, they'd ask me about Neanderthals or saber-toothed cats. And I would say, I would speak out of two sides of my mouth. Well, honey, if Earth is old, here's your answer. If Earth is young, here's your answer. Give them two different flavors. Then about 12 years ago, I went to this talk by the guy who's now the vice president of, of our ministry. And the talk was something like dinosaurs walk with man. And I'm like, 
this guy's a looney tune. Who in the world in their right mind would believe man walked with dinosaurs? I, I can't believe this guy. So I went to his talk as a skeptic because I had heard that perspective before, but I always just framed it as some like cute, like fundamentalist homeschool belief with these guys that just didn't know any better. So I went to the talk. I'm like, like I'm a PhD. I deal with evidence. I'm trained in the sciences and the natural sciences. I can't believe this guy's going to believe this stuff. So I went to his talk as a skeptic and about halfway through, I'm like, oh my gosh, wait a second. This guy's onto something. And wh what about this soft tissue? And why do all these people groups around the world have the same myths and legends and cave drawings and histories about these dinosaur-like creatures that look like dragons? And, and what about all these evidences? And you know, what about scripture and death before sin? So this guy tailspun me with all this avalanche of evidence. I'm like, oh my gosh. I've got to drill into this and find if it's true. So I took 90 days sabbatical pretty much off of life and, and obsessively plunged into this stuff because I love research, love evidence. Man, I bought thousands of dollars worth of books and DVDs. I flew up to Canada. I flew to Montana. I'm like, if what this guy is saying, I've got to find out for myself if it's true. But halfway through this process, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's right. He's stone cold right now. I wasn't just somewhat convinced. I became overwhelmingly convinced that dinosaurs lived recently and were all smashed, died, and buried up in the flood. So it was a huge learning experience for me, but I was already saved. I was a full of the Holy Ghost, converted, regenerate Christian who didn't believe in the age of the earth. And up to that point, it really hadn't mattered too much other than how I was raising my kids with two different framework. But when I got, when I had my eyes open let's just say on 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 the age of the earth and dinosaurs and Noah's flood for me it was like being born again again all of a sudden that 18 inch separation between my mind and my heart got snapped into alignment like a chiropractic adjustment i'm like oh my gosh the bible's got a whole different story and viewpoint and narrative about the world and what i've been taught by the world is incorrect all the way back from a 13 billion year old universe to the dinosaurs living 65 million years ago. But for me, brother, the, the, here's, here's the catch is that I believe in my personal experience for the Lord to allow my eyes to be open to those things about a recent flood, recent creation. Step number one for me before I took that journey was I had to humble myself under scripture and say, Lord, if it's true, please teach me. And so I stopped approaching scripture with the arrogance of my own lens and my own background, my own training, my own smarts. And I just came to God as a three-year-old. I'm like, hey, man, if this is true, please show me that it's true. And then and then it's like the, the Lord took me providentially on this journey, went up to Montana, went, went to Canada. And brother, here's the thing. I've seen things that you can't unsee. When you're looking at Dinosaur Provincial Park over a 14-mile stretch of dead dinosaurs buried under 50 feet of mud, I'm like, how on earth could this not be a worldwide flood? And then you look at these creatures and they look like beef jerky and they've got soft tissue and not just one, two, three kinds of soft tissue, 16 different flavors of soft tissue. So that was my experience. And for me, it allowed my roots that had stopped penetrating down in my soul because I was confused about age of the earth, Darwinism, evolution, all that stuff. When I believed in creation, for me, it allowed the depth of my discipleship and the depth of my relationship with God and his word to be taken to a whole new level. And that's my personal experience. Other people are going to have diff different walks, but, but I know as true as I sit here today, earth is young, dinosaurs live with man, they died in the flood, the, the whole bit. And I don't have any doubts about it. And for me, now I'm able to read through scripture without those hesitations and without those quick reflexes that go, oh, wait a minute, what about doesn't start like, oh, what about the age of the earth? What about dinosaurs? So it was it was like being born again again when I became a, a believer in, in the young earth. So well, and of course that would have that effect. I mean, any revelation uh is going to change you forever because it's a deeper um it's a deeper inspiration than just a cognitive one. It, it, there's something else that we can't always explain. That is the transcendence. That is what yeah. makes God unique and special and one of a kind and, uh, and, and, and needs to, you know, I guess it's tricky to be God because, you know, for him to reveal himself to us and literally tells us, by the way, you can't ever see me. 
just want you to know, you know, even Moses wasn't even allowed to look at my face because it'll kill you. It's like, okay, yeah. like what the heck? I mean, so it's hard to even it it it's a it it brings up all kinds of other questions like, well, God, you made us. Why didn't you get us closer to you? Why didn't you make it easier to understand? You know, and perhaps yeah. we could account for the fall as to a disconnect from our communion because Adam and Eve communed with God, right? And he walked amongst them. And I don't know how much of that is, you know, he's still transcendent. So I don't know if that had a metaphorical element to it or if there was a dimensionalized God. God. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that we ever yeah. will know some of these. I mean, I don't think there's something inherently wrong with God having mysterious parts. <laughs> I think that should kind of go along with being oh. perfect and being omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent, that you probably are going to have elements that literally cannot be grasped intellectually, because that's a very um, confined uh, aspect of of observing reality is your intellect, because we, we don't know everything we never can, or we'd be God. But what you did say yeah, to me, I think, is something... It makes us have a childlike faith. Yeah, that's it. Good point. Yes, yeah. and 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 I've heard sometimes people will act like you have to jettison your your brain and your um, life experience to become a, a religious believer, and they they mock that as though you're, being a child just simply means to be ignorant and to be foolish. But I think I think it's different than that. I think that the, that there's a thing about being a child that is unique, and that is it's the only time you're innocent. Yeah. And it's the only time in your existence in humanity that anything's possible. You don't set boundaries on yourself yet. Now, clearly, it also means that they're ignorant on the things and that it they don't know that there's no such thing as whatever it would be. I can fly or Santa Claus or whatever people are teaching a kid that they're going to buy wholeheartedly because they're children. They don't have the intellect to life experience to evaluate and make draw conclusions that are true yeah. uh, but it's also beautiful it also allows us to have the fantasy books and the lord is the rings and 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 uh you know lion witch in the wardrobe this sort of way of finding god in the deeper places and i think it's kind of what you nice. were mentioning is there's yeah. this sort of personal experience that is undescribable and and you can't you can't deny mm -hmm. it even though it's subjective to you uh, you know, I don't know what your experience was. I only have my version. Uh, and, obviously. You know, time's a million though, brother. I think you're absolutely right because what, what kept me out of the know, I believe about creation was my prideful, arrogant perspective. Like God, I know better. And look at those cute little fundamentalist homeschool kids believing in this 6,000 year nonsense. How the, well, they're just, you know, they're just this little incubated group and they just don't know they don't watch nova and science channels and everything but i know better god's like i'm going to turn the tables on you son what if they have the truth and you don't right you know and that that just blew me away for so for me i i i believe my key to really knowing god and understanding the scripture the key to get in that door was humility mm. was just childlike faith to say lord may, maybe it's true i don't know but i'm going to trust i'm going to elevate your word over over the the world's word and that for me just blew open the door to discovery when i discovered or took the cover off of the evidence that convinced me god's word is true and the world's got a whole other story that's of smoke and mirrors well, and again, in just a moment, we'll get into some of those details that you uh, use in your ministry. Obviously, I want you to be able to have a chance to expound on that. But like I said, um, I do want to take you in directions maybe that hasn't been a typical interview for you because I find them equally important. And, yeah. and I think that you can bring us a perspective from your angle that might help people in other avenues of exploration in the spiritual realm. Because whenever you're dealing with a a subjective human experience has the double-edged sword of not only giving you an insight that changes you forever in a good way, but it can also lead to cult behavior. I mean, every mm -hmm. cult thinks they see something nobody else sees, and some of there them will go. kill themselves with <laughs> Nike tennis shoes and a track suit, believing that hale Bop Comet's going to take them home, and they kill oh. themselves. Now, they were yeah. convinced 
that they are the 23 smartest people on earth or whatever it was. So there is a danger potentially in that too. And so, and so what I'm getting, I'm not denying your experience or that it's even true. What I'm trying to find out is, okay, so how do we discern this insight, this subjective insight is in fact God's deeper revelation as opposed to some sort of cognitive bias. And the, and the best example I can think of for you to comment on is the LDS, the Mormon, because they will be told, if you really want to know if this is true, you come to God and you say, tell me if this is true. And they said, I received a burning in my bosom that Joseph Smith was in fact a prophet. And he wasn't. He wasn't. He was a cult leader, uh, divinator, con man. There's proof of all of this evidence. The guy was arrested yeah. for ripping people off, stealing things. But their burning in the bosom gave them an insight that said we must follow him and become a Mormon. And so there's so oh so I want to use your experience and your data uh, science experience to say so. Then how does one differentiate? between an insight that that is very specific to you but also has also has access to the average person to 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 hear what you're saying and it comports to reality in other areas i don't know if i'm explaining this properly. Uh, no, i i i get you man uh we we get that question a lot and i've been told to pray about the book of mormon several times i've met with several mormons and do the outreach thing the evangelical thing with them and they hand you the book and say pray about it wait for the burning of the bosom that, that they call it and i say look you know what if i were to tell you that that god's a, a green spaghetti monster up in the sky and you prayed about it and you got some heartburn i mean is that going to confirm my testimony to yours i mean come on we, we can't do that we ha- need to have a litmus test And you see, when it comes to creationists or evolutionists, we have four to 5,000 years of written history. Most people would agree with that. And history never records a new kind ever being spontaneously generated. Raccoons beget raccoons, dogs beget dogs, and cats beget cats. So we don't have observational data to confirm an evolutionist perspective or a creationist perspective. So the litmus test for the discussion amongst Christians has to be God's word. And I ran it headlong into two passages of scripture that boxed me in theologically that I would challenge anybody from any scholarly background, old earth, gap, progressive days, you, you name it. There's logically no way out of these two boxes, at least in my opinion. The first would be the fourth commandment. The here we're dealing with the section of scripture God wrote with his own hand He only wrote this much of scripture with his own hand. Exodus 31 says he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own hand rather than having any other man do it. And he said to Moses, which Moses then conveyed to the Israelites, for in six days I created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Four layers, heaven, earth, sea, everything that's in them. And he's telling Moses to tell the Israelites to believe he did it in six days. So communication's got a sender and a receiver. In this case, this sender is God. He's telling the re- the receivers that it was six days as they would understand days. Boom, case closed. God says, work for six, have a Shabbat. Work for six, have a, have a Sabbath, you know? And so for, for me, I, I had to ask myself the question, why would God want me to believe something other than what he told the Israelites to believe? So the six days, ironclad, sealed, box it up. There's no way out of that, at least in my opinion. Now, I've had people try by mythologizing the, the fourth commandment or the ten commandments or trying to map it back to ancient Near, Near Eastern myth, but still game over, case closed. And on the age of the earth, same thing, Luke chapter 3, just go there. we got 77 patriarchs listed from Jesus all the way back to Adam. And there's a little clause in there that says, Adam, comma, the son of God. So not Adam, the son of 10,000 years or 100,000 years of Neanderthals that goes back to Cro-Magnon, a man that goes back to Homo sapiens that spun off of some ape human line. It was just Adam, the son of God. So that is the linchpin for that theology of a young earth because we've got 77 patriarchs going back 4,000 years 
from Jesus to Adam, then it says Adam, comma, the son of God, because it's going son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, then it goes to Adam, the son of God. So there's no gap, there's no stretch. I mean, evolutionists or old earth Christians have to insert somehow another 94,000 years of gaps or human evolution in that little clause. They have to snap the clause, Adam, the son of God, and insert 94,000 years worth of random, bloody, murderous selection of the fittest to get from Cro-Magnon man or Neanderthal man over to Homo sapiens. And I just don't buy it. I I, I just, for me, I, I can't do that <laughs> to scripture. Um, so that's what landed me on the, the six real days and the and the theology of the young earth. So the Cro-Magnon man and the Neanderthal man, do does your... Uh, um... Does does your um, I'm I'm not sure what you call it your ministry your apologetics I'm not sure how you frame your nomenclature but uh, yeah. does it agree that the, they existed or do you I mean and if so what are they hundred <clears throat> percent so skeletons and fossils are real but if you were to interview the leading uh, curators of these fossils these human fossils that supposedly show ape to human line of of, of evolution. Uh, even even uh, Ian Tattersall, the, the leading, you know, some of these leading directors of museums would say that you could fit all of that evidence into the back of a pickup truck. Some people would say into the into a bathtub. So all the evidence you're, you're talking about Australopithecines and Homo habilis and all these other creatures that supposedly show this chain from ape like creatures to humans, put it into a bathtub. You know, that's some pretty weak evidence. So. In, in, in every instance, the, the fossils that, that make up these icons, like an Australopithecus or Homo habilis, it's either all ape or all human or it's mixed. And, uh, but they fit into one of those three categories and the evidence is, is, is very, very weak. But um, uh, you, you pick something like Neanderthals, well, they now learn that they're just humans. They're just blocky, sturdy humans that have a body frame morphology that's similar to like Samoans. They're, they're thick, they're blocky, they have 15% bigger cranium capacity than we have today. And, but they made musical instruments. They made some kind of crazy glue for hafting their points, which we can't even figure out today how they did it. They had musical instruments. They worshiped. They had ceremonial burials. They dove down into the ocean at certain depths to retrieve shells that they used for tools. These guys were smart. They, they were just humans. And then we've now confirmed from a genetic standpoint that they bred with people that we would call today as homo sapiens. So they were completely human just of a certain morphology that was different than most people you would see today yes well so do you think that i mean clearly darwin's um uh, origin of species and uh his uh his uh, groundbreaking work i don't know how groundbreaking i think a couple guys preceded him in this in this potential perspective of uh um adaptation and whatnot but nevertheless he's the one that got all the accolades for supposedly giving you uh, the ability to be a um uh, uh intellectually satisfied atheist as dawkins talked about you know it gives him a sense of uh um i guess teleology i mean if if they want to make that leap it, it clearly if atheism was actually true then life is meaningless so i don't even know why they do science because it's all yeah. it's all a big giant facade that they literally have to teach themselves to live in a lie to survive and to and to to thrive as a human until they fall into oblivion at death so they, the whole thing, you know, I think part of the way I even assess philosophy's value is, is it livable? Can you even do it? And if you have to borrow from my faith system to have human rights, to have women's rights, to have a sense of, 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 of slavery being um, uh, immoral, uh, the idea of not murdering, all the things that can't exist from uh, an accidental uh, wow. uh, evolutionary mutational cell structure, uh, then it, it's to me, if you're intellectually honest, you abandon something that can't even survive or function without stealing from an antithetical belief system. It just sh should be a proof. That's system. a great point. Love it. But, 
Well, but I mean, it, I, I don't know what else to say about it. You know, they live yeah. life as though it has meaning and they'll write 500 page books reaching the conclusion that life is meaningless. Well, that must include your book. Why did you take the time? So anyways, <laughs> that's another uh, story. But one of the things that I think uh, I would like you to elaborate on a bit for folks watching, uh, because I don't know of any Christian, true believer, any that doesn't believe science is very valuable that it is a tool that God has given us to observe nature and his handiwork. It's not some, you know, the atheist scientists, the materialists, this is what I always find funny. They'll discover something interesting and then they announce it almost as though they invented it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. we, look what we invented, this new Adam thing. No, you didn't. You discovered what was already there that you had no wow. hand in. And all you did is describe it. You are a descriptive philosophy, who, what, when, where, and how. And it works wonderfully proving that God is real and here's how he did it. But you venture into a three-letter word that isn't yours and it doesn't belong to your materialistic philosophy. If it's in the word is why. The moment you say why, you're no longer in physics. You're in, uh, you're in metaphysics. And that's where my people have discovered a long time ago by God, uh, that there is a deeper place. And it's the meaning, the meaning of life that can only come from a creator. So tell people, if you would, yeah. so they don't, in case there's somebody watching accidentally and they're kind of like thinking you're one of these crazy screwballs, you know, for one thing, I think there's a mistake in that they believe that you don't believe in adaptation. And I don't know that that's true, but there's certainly a difference between micro evolution if you want to use that as a catch-all term but if but but i think the better term is adaption god created biological entities that can adapt to things that's just a beautiful god inbred uh uh access point that we have uh which is different than uh m the meta narrative of macro evolution where things come out of nowhere where species are bursting onto the scene from another it's so absurd if you just try to look at it if you were first handed this story tabula rasa <laughs> yeah. know, this, is, this is ridiculous but mm -hmm. once you're this far down the road you just kind of accepted it so can you can you kind of show us uh from a young earth pers perspective how evolution if we want to use that word uh you do find compelling in the micro sense as uh, when we see it as an adaption adaptation of the of the um, organism just getting through life because things have happened to it that caused it to have to change to, can you kind sure. of sure yeah that? absolutely so first let's uh, let's uh let's talk about the science box itself so if you were to take science and frame it as a tapestry you can just unzip it and cut it in half you could bifurcate the field of science and this this gets our evolutionist friends mad but look i i've dealt in the sciences for 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 decades this really is a true analogy it's a true comparison there's two compartmentally separate types of science there's a scientific method or observational science which every creationist worth his salt is going to back 100 percent this is where you observe, test, repeat, replicate, and draw conclusions. That's real science. We put people on the moon this way. We develop new medicines this way. We can prove gravity exists. We can prove all kinds of stuff with real observational science. The second box, however, is historical science. That's when we dig up a fossil and abstractly paint what, what it might have looked like or we draw inferences. I mean, all you know about that fossil is that it died. And then it had a bone structure that looked like it is. But when you start putting flesh on it or start talking about its mom or its offspring, now we're starting to abstract and use inferences. And science gets really weak when we do that. So historical science, evolution is based on historical science. We can't go back 5,000 years or 10,000 years or a million years and set up video cameras and watch evolution happen. It's not observable, testable, and repeatable. That therefore requires faith. So now let's talk about what we can see. Let's just pick Darwin's finches. That is the trophy case of evolution. Darwin says, look, man, I go to this island called the Galapagos. There's 12 different species of these finches. Well, he called them spe different species, right? And 
When they land on this island, they get short little stubby beaks and their feet can change. When they land on this island and reproduce, they get skinny little beaks and their feet can change also. So look at that, it must be evolution, case closed. Well, about 10 years ago, some Swedish scientists got together and said, well, let's study Darwin's finches scientifically. Let's observe, test, and repeat these finches and see what happens with them. So they track these finches, a thousand of them, for a couple of generations. And they learned, oh my goodness, within one generation, they can change their beak size and shape and their feet morphology. And it all has to do with this phenomenon known as epigenetics. So their bodies continuously read their environment and their, di and their diet. And if they're going to be eating short, stubby, eating things where their short, stubby beaks are going to require crushing seeds, then they'll adapt and their bodies will trigger, toggle these binary switches on and off epigenetics with methylated tags on them that will code the next generation for, hey man, short stubby beaks are what's going to work on this place where we're eating stuff. But for the birds that are going to have to peck down deep and grab little critters underneath sand where the long skinny beaks are going to be favorable, the bodies code and express proteins for those types of adaptations, but they're still just finches. And you could take the finches from each island or each food source and switch them and the next generation they'll change. So what we're learning scientifically using real science, observational science, is that God has built in the codes in our gene pool, because these changes I'm talking about, they don't even change the DNA. It's the same DNA expressing the, the protein coding differently for adaptations and changes. So science would show that the changes are inherent to the creature, not to the external environment causing natural selection or adaptation. These changes are built in the animal just like a cruise control is built into our car. Our cruise control can read the car in front of us with a little radar, read the speed, track on the brakes, modern cars, uh, of course. And that's the same way God has engineered uh, these creatures to read their environments and change. Dr. Galuza, the head of ICRS, done a ton of research on this. He's got this theory called continuous environmental tracking and he's got it proven with case after case with cave fish and birds and fish and all, all different types of creatures that show these changes are built within the animal not happening externally well and that's again like you said where <clears> they, <throat> they would take this true observation but it's simply it's really kind of no different than uh a tall guy is probably more adept to playing basketball so he he goes and plays basketball uh it doesn't make him a subhuman or a superhuman makes him a tall human uh he's yeah. still a, one of us he just happens to have a different flavor different color different maybe uh, bone structure i guess right M males yeah. have thicker bones and whatever but we're still humans and we just have different kind of sizes and shapes um and so i think that what happens is from what i've understood and it's certainly not my uh my belly look like it is you but you know they extrapolate that since the beak clearly has changed uh then over time it turns into a fish it's like this doesn't make it's not even it's such a category error, error as to not even really make sense but then again what else do you do what else can you do if you have eliminated the possibility of an engineer? If you yeah. have decided, I'm going to set up a, an arbitrary fence that states you can't look over here. Well, what if there's answers there? Nope, I've decided there's no answer in the transcendent. You can't even speculate there was a designer here. Uh, it's not even science, frankly, unless it's strictly materialistic and uses only materialistic uh, observations and utilizes own materialistic um, ma matter. And so that's, that's a great I'm, point. Yeah. yeah. And so if you've created an arbitrary boundary and say, God, I don't believe in God because he has not revealed himself. He'd say, well, what if he is on the other side of the fence that you've put up? Yeah. You that's did it. Yeah. You know and, why? And make and, it even more ironic. The Bible forecasts that people would do that. Romans says, Romans 1 says they're going to harden their hearts, their mind, they're going to get darkened in their understanding. And right. 2 Peter 3 says that they're going to be willingly ignorant of denying that God created out of nothing, uh, out of water, created the earth, earth from nothing, and then, and then cataclysmically destroyed the world with the flood. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. People are willingly ignorant of these things. Well, and people too, I mean, I think what if you see it in a, in a deeper 
level, what happens is not that science isn't real. We all believe that or that it's not helpful and effective as a tool. It is. What happens for these materialists, these secular humanists, is they worship science. That is their religion. It be, once it becomes a spiritual realm, you can't get that out of somebody's head because they, it is sacred to them. And that's why they will say, well, you know, science teaches us. And I always want to scream at the radio. Science doesn't teach me anything. Scientists do but not science. No. That's just a theory, uh, a construct that we use to sort of draw conclusions. But it takes a human who can be objective and hopefully honest to draw conclusions on what he sees. So what would you say, um, and this is kind of going back to what we started with, but I think it it could be maybe something you've been, I don't know, you've probably been asked every question by now, but I'm curious about it because I, I think this is a really important path that I, I want to use your expertise with. And it is this idea of, for someone who's watching this right now, who maybe has always believed in, you know, old earth and billions of years, and science has kind of proven that. And it's not because I'm against the Bible. It's just science is a, is a different category that we use to make observations. And the Bible isn't necessarily a science book, right? They're going to say that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so once again, I want to kind of come back to the Ken Ham um, um, analogy, where where as a brother in Christ, we are a, we are in the same boat. But then he would, might say, but if you don't believe the way I'm saying it, which is truly what the Bible is saying to us, then you're not really a believer that the Bible is inerrant. Or even, I guess I wouldn't say he would say you're not a Christian. I, I'm not sure that he'd go that far, but certainly is is kind of deciding that you are reading errors into what you consider an in and an, um a book that is is inerrant right there are christians who read the bible believe it's inerrant believe 6000 believe all that but they're so committed to the bible's um absolute uh um description of how the earth works that what the bible also teaches us along with six thousand years is the earth's flat and it's on four pillars and there's a firmament and it's literally a a like a globe a, a snow globe uh we've never gone beyond it uh, there are no photos of the earth there is it's all been cgi or nasa is using it to um try to get us to worship uh, 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 a, a heliocentric world as opposed to geocentric. And the Bible is very clear. Uh, and if you don't believe that, you just don't believe the Bible. Now, there are real people who are honest to God believers who believe the earth is flat. And they would use the same premise you did. Because that's what the Bible says. So we either have to assume they're right and we're even missing yeah. that. Or is it possible to misinterpret or to or to add substance to maybe a metaphorical idea, an, a, a, a poetry, right? A parable we know Jesus used. So how do you, what would be, let's start there. What is your take on those who use the Bible to say the earth is flat? Yeah, yeah, great, great point. So, so I, I would say that as a as a presuppositional creation minister, I I I adhere first and foremost to, to God's word. I don't think really a case can be made from the Bible for a flat Earth. I know that some people believe that it can. I believe that there's enough color in those verses to clearly interpret a spherical Earth on the, on that discussion. And secondly, I would say so that first going from the Bible, I believe Earth is round; it's a sphere. Uh, but then secondly, I would also employ observational science, not historical science, but the tools of observational science to show that Earth is round like the Bible talks about. Um, and I understand some people have a lot of, they got a lot of dogs in this fight. They believe that Earth is flat um, and, and that's going to be their, their truth journey. Um, I, I would say, you know, scripture is clear that it's a, it's, a, it's a sphere and then i would also say that we can employ observational science tools to show that it's not flat but it's rather uh rather round yeah okay nothing i'm not a 
afraid of observational science. So yeah. historical and, science, when you start getting interpretations and stuff, but, but uh, yeah. Well, but, but then, but, but I've heard these folks tell me that, well, science uh, is telling us the earth is, is a, a, a globe, but they're doing that because they're, secular and they're trying to not let the earth be the center of the universe which the way god created it because we are the apple of his eye and we are what he created as the ultimate conclusion of his creation and and that's and the earth is round but it's a disc and again i'm not yeah. obviously i don't believe in that I, i'm just trying to yeah. correlate how people are sincere in saying but the bible says about um you know, the four corners of the earth and so forth. And like you said, I think yeah. it's a metaphor. It's like saying, it's like saying, well, does God have wings? Because he says he shelters us like hens. So is he wing? Is he feathers now? Yeah. So, but so That's here's true. my point though. So some folks would say, that's what you're doing. That's what you're yeah. doing is that you're saying, yeah. well, it says six days, but could that also have a representation as a, as a space of time that doesn't necessarily have uh, uh, parameters. And I know you did say that, you know, you you've saw other areas where it's very clearly a 24 hour day. And thus you just sort of move that backwards all the way to the beginning space where God started. But what do you say to folks who are saying you're kind of doing the same thing? Yeah. I, I would say that the analogy doesn't follow all the way in the following regard is that, if you take uh, young earthers and old earthers, um, old earthers would they would both say that they hold to scripture, and but the old earthers would have to rely upon historical science lens and historical science viewpoints to argue their case for an old earth, whereas flat earthers uh, would would try to rely on observational science and would fail in that regard. So that's where kind of the grid work doesn't work for me all the way through. Is that the the, the 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 flat earther would say i know earth is flat because of the bible but then they would fail in the demonstration using observational science but an old earther and a young earther when it comes at the age of the earth we can both rely on and trust on observational science but the age of the earth requires a clear adherence to historical sciences which bring in perspectives worldview and interpretation on the data Okay, so, so that, that so, for me would be a little bit different. Okay, so so break that down a little bit deeper when you say historical science. So so what is it that you think is being neglected uh, by those who believe in an old earth? In other words, what is the evidence that you are that you are grabbing in this historical uh, science method uh, that you believe the old earthers are are not adding to the equation? Yeah, so I, I think one one easy way to start would be. Uh, the fossil record right because it's 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 one thing to talk about things in the sky or astronomy uh with things that are abstract that we have to go out and look at and then make inferences and abstractions about what they used to be like in the past but we can walk to montana right now go on the hell creek formation and find thousands of dead creatures buried under a foot of mud all the way up to 100 feet of mud so it's pretty reasonable we could grab those fossils and start making abstractions so an old, an old earther would say that based upon dating the ash layers that are in those strata, we can use radiometric dating to say that there was a, a Jurassic era that was, say, 100 million years old and, and, and older. And then there was a Cretaceous era that ended the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. And all of that would be based upon dating the radiometrically dating the ash layers that are in those strata. Uh, a young earther would look at the same information and say, yeah, there were several sequences of the flood. There was a Jurassic habitat and environment that was buried first. And then on top of that, we find the Cretaceous dinosaurs. And yes, there are ash layers that demonstrate events that happened during those burial processes, but it all happened within a year. And so when we take the radiometric dating into the laboratory, a young earther would say, look, Mr. and Mrs. Old Earther, you can't prove to me that the rate of the de decay has been the same and constant over millions of years. You can't prove to me the starting parent element, the st starting amount of the daughter element, and you can't prove to me that it was a closed process through which you're using your radiometric dating. And an honest scholar would have to say, you're right, I can't go back and prove those things. So we have to rely on, uh, on a worldview or abstraction to save millions of years or young earth. 
You take carbon dating, for example. Well, carbon-14 is found inside dinosaur bones, which itself should prove that Earth is young because carbon dating only lasts for about 60,000 years and some detection devices can go up to 100,000 years. But when you look at radiometric dating carbon, well, then if you have anything like a forest fire or a volcanic eruption or a solar flare or Earth's magnetic pull to the moon, all these different factors can greatly impact carbon-14 dating. And we know it works good for a couple thousand years back, but why are all of a sudden there between 300 and 700 BC? Well, we can't date anything along that line because it's just a flat line. We don't know what's going on there. And in 1500 BC, there was this carbon-14 dating anomaly that everything always misses it by a couple hundred years. What's going on back there? So if just in that recent time of a few thousand years, we've got all these conditions and caveats in interpreting car carbon-14 dating, well, First of all, we can't even interpret anything before 1950s because our own blowing up of atomic bombs in the 1950s absolutely doubled the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So you go back just three or three or 4,000 years, there's all these caveats and conditions Then, how in the world can we think we can date something back 45,000 years ago? Was anything else going on 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago? So that's where we're going to start separating from an old earther that they're going to rely sovereignly upon Earth's record and the ash or the carbon-14 and really trust those things going back. Whereas myself as a scientist and as a young Earth creationist, I'm going to say observational science we can take to the bank all day long. But when you start having to require uh, inferences and, and, and assumptions and abstractions, I'm going to start losing faith in that and regaining my faith in the, in the, the word of God. Mm. So what, you know, and this isn't for you to put you in a spot of making an indictment to the old earthers, because I, and I hope you understand that even in this conversation, I'm playing more of a, I hope uh, uh, the, the, the layman watching who might want to ask questions and I'm trying to find that place for them um, yeah. because we, we know what you believe and certainly people that want to study that can get much deeper i'm sure you have and we can put a link on uh, for you any uh, books or any kind of uh, materials as well as this uh movie you said is coming out that i'm guessing is dealing with the arc and perhaps i don't know what what you're discussing about that in general maybe there's more uh uh to to it than i realize but um i do want to try to try to find some problems with your perspective so that people can at least hear that you, there's an answer to it whether they agree with it yeah. or, or find it compelling yeah. at least let's try you know everybody if, if any belief system that can't withstand intellectual scrutiny should be abandoned it's not worth your time either it can stand on its own or it can't and that's yeah. what i think uh, guys like you have made sure um you relating folks know is is this isn't some kind of i don't know some kind of cult like um um sort of I don't know, making the, the words of the Bible uh, fit a narrative that makes you more comfortable. You're trying to accept the Bible as, I guess, the standard that you start with. It's the presupposition that yeah. defines your ab ability to um, evaluate scientific discoveries, I guess. Would that be fair to say that that's the, that's the foundation? And thus, if there's a confusion in scientific data in the Bible, well, then you're going to go to the word of God. And where do we, where does the science sort of not have authority in your mind when it comes Great to point. its conclusion? Yeah, you know, I, I think for me, as I mentioned before, for, for me, I think the key for discovering my perspective about the age of the earth and dinosaurs and all that, it was the, the key to get into that understanding was humility under the word of God. So by full admission, I am a presuppositional apologist. I presuppose the Bible to be true. But then I also know it to be true now because I've been able to remap all that I've learned about science back into that framework. And for me, it, it fits perfectly. There are some things that we'll never know. I, I don't I, I mean, I'm still holding out for someone to have the, the best definition of distant starlight, you know. I don't think we've been able to answer that question, and I don't think anyone ever will be able to answer that question. I think I the, the word 
uh, of Job, you know, what God said to Job is like, do you know the way to Job to the source of light? You know, God sarcastically asks that of Job. So I think there's a number of things that just to be honest, we're never going to be able to answer fully. But what we do know, what we can see around us in geology, paleontology, biology, absolutely perfectly fits a young earth framework in my, in my pers perspective. Anyhow. Okay, so where do the dinosaurs fit then? For Because a lot of people would say that you guys don't believe in dinosaurs or that Satan yeah. made counterfeit <laughs> bones or something. I mean, obviously, oh, they, they turn it into a parody, but um, yeah. but a but dinosaurs existed clearly so what is that all about man great great uh hot button for me because it was really dinosaurs that confirmed for me that that the young earth so just look at it biblically uh, I'm, I'm day five you have birds and fish on day six you have mammals and man created god said he created all the land creatures on day six and then he told adam and eve to name them and to take dominion over them those two things. So when you name something like your son or God, your God told Adam to name the animals, you're taking dominion over them as if you issued them. You're like, they're mine. They're under me. Everything under Adam and Eve's dominion fell at the fall when they ate the forbidden fruit. And so animals turned against each other. And But we do know that God created them because he describes behemoth which is nothing but a sauropod dinosaur. Again, no way out of that box. So that's a sauropod dinosaur. There's 14 different characteristics described about that creature in Job chapter 14 or 40 perfectly describes a sauropod dinosaur. And then God describes the Leviathan in the very next chapter, a real creature, which God says retreats before nothing, which is probably a dinosuchus crocodile, a super croc, a 40 foot long crocodile that we now have fossil record evidence that actually shows it was seven tons and eight dinosaurs by snatching them up from, from swamps or whatever. So, Dinosaurs did live recently. They walked with man and they were creation by God himself. Where were they? The Garden of Eden is, I mean, I'm guessing is somewhat limited, right? I mean, was the Garden of Eden the earth, the globe at that point? And then it kind of got reduced because we know that they were uh, sent from the garden at the fall and not allowed to return. So it seems to be a small area. So every animal that has had or been created on in history uh and many of them are dead now right they're they're extinct so Absolutely. there must have been even more that existed <laughs> simultaneously so where would they fit uh yeah in the garden created on the on the sixth day uh, in the garden of eden and then that place fell and the first world that was created says second peter three was destroyed in the flood we're on the second version of Earth today. So they're they're there on that first created Earth, but they're buried under 10, sometimes 100 feet of mud. And we know it happened during the flood. I mean, if you just look at the Morrison Formation in the middle of America, we're talking about a 600,000 mile region with 13 states. It's a 300 foot thick pancake that spreads 13 states, 600,000 miles, filled with 52 different species of dinosaurs. How would you do that without a worldwide flood? So we know they were created. They're buried here in hundreds of feet of mud, even in the middle of America. So so that's, I guess, what I was getting at. And and I've never, honestly, never even thought about it till this second. So it's, I'm, I'm kind of uh, walking this uh, in my own mind and finding it kind of intriguing. I think when we talk about the Garden of Eden, we consider it a very specific space on the globe, a very specific defined space because um, when they fell, like you said, there was a boundary place where they were sent out of the garden. They were forced out of it. And then uh, a, an angel was placed there to say, you don't get back in. So obviously it was a specific uh, geological area of, I guess, the whole earth, right? Because the whole earth existed. But wait a minute, if the dinosaurs are in Montana and we have to assume the Garden of Eden is in, I don't even know where, Iran or Persia, I'm not sure. So yeah. God was yeah. creating animals all over the earth that they Certainly. never would have even seen. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I see what you're getting at exactly now. So yeah. yeah, the Garden of Eden specifically was buried and destroyed cataclysmically by the flood. It's probably under 100, 200 feet of sediment. Um, and we have, just like if you go to 
different cities nowadays, you'll have Washington Street or Lincoln Street. We have several different places that are named <clears throat> after features that were in the Garden of Eden. But the Garden of Eden proper was buried by the flood because God said he was going to resurface the earth by the flood and scrub man from it, the very existence from the earth. In fact, God says, I will use the earth to destroy humans as a tool for destroying them. So uh, the Garden of Eden was a specific geographical place in the pre-flood earth. And you're right, the dinosaurs might have been a thousand miles away from the particular garden. Absolutely. So would he have But they started made, out in the garden. So know, he, would God around. have, you know, and maybe maybe we don't really know the answer to this clearly <laughs> because it's he didn't go into great detail. But if God said he Adam named every animal, every animal, or at least gave it its species name, I guess, or something, right? I mean, I don't yeah. know that he's called him Joe. He said, you're a dinosaur. And you're, <laughs> it's, I mean, I guess, right? I, I've never even honestly broke it down like this. No, um, we, we know what happened there, too. There was about 7,000 animal animals total on the ark and only about 1,400 different kinds. So certainly Adam could have named those within just one day. But creationists believe when you've studied the field of baromenology, the original created kind, there were just a couple thousand different varieties of animals. So are those the ones that would have, because <clears throat> this would certainly be another challenge, uh, is the Ark, which you said you're doing, you've done a whole movie on, and that'd be interesting to hear where that's going to come out if people want to see that. But yeah. the Ark means that he brought every animal of its kind, I understand that, uh, onto the Ark. Obviously, not every animal that's ever existed. It would just be impossible for them to fit. Um, but if he had a kind that survived and then they ended up breeding and that through adaptation, whatever, had different, different types of kinds, I guess. I don't know enough about it yeah. to even make yeah. the, the proper uh, uh, word usage here. But um so oh man it, it's so clean and easy to describe what happened there yeah i had to do that. I, I really struggled with that early on like how in the world could you do it so we answer that clearly uh, in the movie and i'll explain it here in a second but yeah the the movie is just you just go to www.noahsflood.com you can see our movie coming out march 20th we've got the long answer there the short answer is simply this is that God did create probably at least 1,400 different types of terrestrial animals that were in fact on board the ark, about 7,000 animals total, because he said seven pairs are the clean kind and then two of every other sort is going to be drawn to you. So God selected the animals to be brought along the ark. So if you just take the dog kind, they probably go back to a, a type of a wolf or canis lupus uh, it would probably be the original dog kind or something that was a pre-wolf. But we've got 339, <clears throat> excuse me, 339 different breeds of dogs that all go back to a wolf. There's over 300 breeds of horses, but they're all still interfertile. 68 different breeds of chickens, they're all interfertile. And if you look at the bear kind, the Ursidae family, even go above the species to the family level of bears. Well, did you know that five of those eight species in the Ursidae bear family are still interfertile? So if you map back all of biology to its family kind like that, you know, 68 chickens go back to a pair, 339 breeds of dogs go back to a pair, same thing with 300 plus breeds of horses and all the bear family, you can map it back easily just to about 1400 different kinds of animals that Adam could have named on the sixth of the day and that God could have used to bring animals on the ark. Same thing with dinosaurs. Evolutionists would say there's a thousand species of dinosaurs, but only about 80 different kinds at the family level, like the ceratopsian kind or the sauropod kind. And you can map it all back like a tree to those original kinds, and you quickly can distill that tree down to just a couple thousand different varieties. So is that similar then to the finchbeak uh, element that we, just, we were talking about earlier, in that if there was a kind of dog... It's almost like a a blueprint, I guess, of 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 dogism, <laughs> dog ishness. Like, was it is it Plato or Aristotle uh, talked about forms? Yeah. Uh, the idea that there is a the, the dog exists. The, the the idea of what dog means, uh, in general. But the specifics is here's a poodle. Here's a Labrador. Here's a, a, a pit bull. So do we have to then uh, uh, follow through with what you're telling me that there was this sort of 
template for dogism and they yeah. bred. And then as those maybe dogs moved on wildly, right? Cause they're uh, coyotes or they're whatever you would even say, but they're living, they're not coming into people's homes initially. <laughs> they're running wild you got uh, it. until they yeah. domesticate. So every one of this, this sort of template dog over time and breeding uh, and I guess mutations, I guess, or what they suddenly started taking on and you end up with a giant greyhound and over here you end up with a poodle, but it all, and that would happen naturally uh, from the, from your perspective, just given uh, genetic mutations or, or changes based on the environment they ended up in or whatever. And this one dog, all dogs came from, is that what you're the, your premises i think that's that, that that's a that's a good summary now the mechanisms are still under dispute you have those who believe that natural selection pressures could have induced some of those changes and then you've got uh other creationists who hold strongly to all of the codes are within the animal as the animal tracks the environment i think that that evolutionists have really overcooked the natural selection idea and they've given a lot of agency and godlike powers to natural selection as an engine to produce all of these different varieties what science real science is actually observable science is doing nowadays is proving scientifically that the changes are and the ability to change is actually built within it's pre-engineered into the creature itself we see fish change rapidly finches change rapidly all diff different kinds of creatures i mean we've even seen lizards within one generation grow longer legs or shorter legs within one generation based upon their habitat if they move from this type of habitat to another habitat and get this even field mice versus tree mice can grow additional vertebrae in short order based upon where they live either in a desert environment or a woodland environment so if we're seeing things like this happen quick, beaks changing and additional vertebrae growing within just generations, how much more do we need to study about how these animals continuously track their environments and change based upon the codes that are within them? So yeah, you look at a wolf, you've got a timber wolf, an Alaskan wolf, and an African wolf. I mean, you, you've got a wolf that can change as much as 80 pounds in its constitution based upon where it's living and what it's eating, but the same wolves, and they're completely interfertile. You can take a scrappy wolf that's living in a, you know, in a, a, at a desert hotter environment, and it can still breed within an Alaskan wolf that weighs 150 pounds with big, huge paws, you know, living up in Alaska and is eating caribou or, or whatever, can still breed with, uh, with an animal within the dog kind. So, all those changes are built, the, the ability to change and morph is built into the code of the animal. So, and some creation want, creationists want to, to argue still about whether natural selection can still have some place in putting pressures that would create some of these changes or limit some of these changes. And, uh, but I think the, the latest epiphany in the science that's coming out is, oh my gosh, a lot of us are wrong. The, the the code to change is pre-engineered in the design fabric of that of that creature. So if God created all that we know and he he put the game in motion and whatnot, um, he created laws and orders in the universe that um, are immutable. That's how we can do science, right? We got to know gravity yeah. will work tomorrow or we can't do things. <laughs> we have to believe in um, the uh, mathematical equations he, that, that are also um uh immaterial right math is is a is a, a concept that's real but not not you can't observe it or repeat it or uh you know what's the atomic weight of one you can't do that yeah uh, but it works and it's still and i believe it's the language of god if you look at the the way god used numbers throughout the bible it clearly is a way he communicates to all people with different languages or even different um uh, different abilities to reason uh mathematics still works for everybody uh, yeah. so it's a way he communicates he's so big so mysterious in some ways just by the inherent nature of being god that it's almost like he has to give us clues of who he is and how he reveals himself because he's too unimaginable mm. and the bible says that 
You know, a friend yeah. of mine uh, named Bart uh, Millard uh, for, is with a, a lead singer of a group called Mercy Me. And he wrote a very famous song, actually the most famous uh, Christian pop song called I Can Only Imagine. Uh, it's a beautiful song. Uh, and it's and it's quite touching, but it's not true. The Bible mm. says you can't imagine what I am. It, uh, there's mm. eye hath not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered in the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. He's basically saying, imagine all you can, but that's a shadow. Yeah. Because there you won't even believe you you can't even imagine what's yeah. coming. God and that's fascinating to me. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, tell me about the movie, uh, just so we so folks can perhaps maybe prepare to go see it. Is this going to be in theaters? Is this going to be a Fathom event? Is this going to be like a digital download yeah. thing? Tell me how people can see it. Absolutely. So we, we put all the movie information on easy to remember website just called noahsflood.com. So Noah's plural, but with not, without the apostrophe, so just noahsflood.com. You can buy tickets there. It's going to be in 900 theaters. It is a Fathom event, so it's two nights only. Uh, it'll be March 20th and 21st, It's uh, uh, but it's got great traction so far. T thousands of tickets have been sold so far, and uh, it's it's in a strong number of theaters. I think the cap we could have hit was 900. It's an 893. Just added two more this week. So it's growing strong, and it does take a young Earth perspective, uh, but it focuses mostly on geology, paleontology, biology, geophysics. Um, the movie's really, to give you kind of the inside scoop, is bro broken up into three different parts. The first part is just amazing eye candy that's never been seen before in Noah's Flood. I mean, the cinema photography that's in this movie is nothing short of Hollywood. It's incredible. Go see the movie just for that alone, if you, if you like. The next third is what we call the three-dimensional lab room. So it's this really cool lab that uh, Ralph Stren, our director, the producer of the movie, does a great job. He brings you into this three-dimensional experience where he's talking about Pangea, and you can kind of see it on this cool lit globe three-dimensional so it's it's you're being talked to in, in, a, in a narrative kind of documentary style but it doesn't feel like that and then the last third would be talking heads experts saying it like it is we've got 10 different experts uh from liberty university answers in genesis great people that talk about the science that backs the, the the flood but the way that the director's done the movie is just when you can't bear any more talking heads all of a sudden you're in the dinosaur world and you've got pterodactyls flying around so there's a lot of relief and uh, it's a very thick movie very intense uh it's it's sciency it's heady but it's also got a lot of amazing uh, graphics in it. So good for junior hires on up, I would think. But just go to noahsflood.com and you can find out about, uh, about the, more about the movie there. I guess um, I would have two more uh, questions for you. And I appreciate your time. It's been very interesting. I appreciate your thoughts, your passion, uh, your uh, fight in the good fight. And I guess over the last few years, based on what we saw in the corona cult, We've seen that we don't know who to trust anymore. We've seen that there's been a politicization of science, of health, of reality. Uh, we have seen groups that have self-identified as the rulers of the earth <laughs> that want to control the rest of us. Certainly hate Jesus and God because he is the only truth in human history of revelation that God, in fact, not only is transcendent and, and exists, but then dimensionalized himself so you could, in fact, have access to him. No other religion's ever done that because the other religions uh, aren't true. And so it's crucial to be aware of that, to be unapologetic about that. If it's true, then why would you apologize? It's crucial that this information gets out. It's the greatest story in human history, literally. But... At this time in our history, in this season, in the world, um, Christians need to find an ecumenical solidarity in the essentials. Jesus is God, came in the flesh, died and rose again bodily. He's the only way to heaven. He's your only sacrifice that by which you can be saved, that you must repent of your sin, and you are in fact a sinner, and you cannot earn anything to get there. It's God's grace and his mercy and his sovereignty 
the end. That's yeah. that. But Amen. he also, I believe, I don't want to say loopholes, but I believe the God I believe in loves his creation so much that he's looking for every opportunity to get you into heaven. He's not looking for ways to get people into hell. He's trying to look for ways to get you out of there and to bring your yourselves to him. So I guess what I would want you to to help people think about is this. So when we have Christians who profess Christ, but they're going to have different points of view, and they might say, yeah, still think the earth is billions, and you say, but I think the Bible says this and that. But how would you, what would you say to them in regards to how we should see each other, how we should journey this thing together. If we can't reach a consensus on this, how do we treat each other? How do we give grace to each other? You know, or is this something that we need to set some lines and put some, some you know, line in the sand? I'm sorry, buddy, you're going to have to come here. This is, I mean, I don't know, but I yeah. do know that I want as many on my side as possible. <laughs> Uh, without so being without being uh, heretical, so yeah. um, what do you say to these fellow brothers? Absolutely, yeah. I I have family members that are old Earth. I I know pastors that 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 are old Earth. Um, I I would simply say this is that salvation is for everybody. Whosoever will let him call on the name of the Lord, and he will be saved. So salvation is for everyone. And if you're a new believer and you you get saved and you're going to start going through the regenerate process where the Holy Spirit is going to be kicking out the old way of thinking and bringing in the new way of thinking, pray to Jesus and ask him what he thinks about evolution. Literally, get in your prayer closet and say, Lord, if I've got something to learn or relearn, please help me out here. Um, you saved me. Thank you very much. And, and I, I, want, I want to go through, through, through that journey. Um, I... I cannot attribute or, or credit my belief in young earth, uh, the, the younger truth is, as I would say it, to myself. It was a gift. I was awarded that gift. And I think the ticket to receiving that gift was humility under scripture. And I would say to all of us, old earthers and young earthers alike, that I think the concern nowadays should not necessarily be unity among denominations on earth and how woke things are getting and trying to strive within unity within diversity or whatever you can't call unity trying to get commonality between the whole diverse landscape of what's going on today in christendom a true christian should be mostly concerned about unity and solidarity from the faith historically going through a timeline not up on earth today because there's a lot of compromise going on in every front you can imagine as we know going on in christianity today. tons of compromise tons of her heresy that's going on so my thrust to christians is to find solidarity and unity going backwards through the timeless installation of our faith through peter paul jesus abraham david all the way back to the beginning we should have unity that way not unity this way and that's where I'm I'm striving is that I want to have unity to the true Orthodox Christian faith. Because I tell you, if you just go down to Los Angeles or San Francisco, drive your car there and get out of your car and walk to any random church, what do you think the likelihood is that you're going to find the type of faith I'm talking about? Slim to almost none in California. You just drive your car to those two cities, get out. Oh, there's a church I'm going to walk in. And look at their doctrine statement and see what they teach, what they believe. Chances are they're going to be off base. Chances are they're not going to teach true Orthodox histor historical Christianity that's in unity this way. And so my thrust is to just have unity this way, timelessly, all the way back to the origins of Scripture. And I'm not going to try to find ways to make unity with people, groups, or denominations that are clearly compromising on, on, on God's word. And uh, and so that for me is the importance right now is unity of faith through the the timeless giver of that faith. I mean, Paul even said that the gospel was kept hidden for generations and was revealed to me to give to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So that that's a pretty personal thing, and that, and that gospel begins in the book of Genesis. So I think these matters are important, and for me, I can at least say that my 
my faith is anchored back to the, the true origins of scripture that go all the way back deeply into Genesis without any compromises. Yes, right. Well, listen, uh, I'm going to have ask you one last question. This is for my subscribers of the Militia of the Mind, those who uh, identify as believers, those who identify as those who care about freedom and uh, free speech and believe in um, free agency, that God gave us our rights. And so uh, it's a question that only ends up behind the paywall for those who subscribe. Um, in that way, it's a little... Um, little trick <laughs> uh, but anyways so uh but it's just a it's just a question just for those subscribers to get it's a little bonus so um and uh it's it's simple but and maybe might be a simple answer for you but only those who subscribe will know so as much as you have done and you obviously are a man of intellect you obviously have a doctorate so you are uh, quite um capable of analytical reason inductive and deductive reason and certainly a believer in philosophy and logic and reason as a a, a, a arbiter of truth and reality if there was or is there or what would be if if it exists what would be you in from your perspective the most challenging idea data point I don't know, just evidence uh, for an older earth. Is there one that you say, you know, I think we can overcome it or we still are working on it or, or maybe there isn't that, but that's up to you. But what would you say would, is the most tricky for a, being intellectually honest for you that you said this, this is challenging when they talk, this is one area where I, I, I will say makes my belief a little bit more uh difficult to navigate or at least more challenging to navigate is there one thing you would say is your achilles heel yeah. folks this is dan biddle this is genesis apologetics and an amazing uh movie coming out in mars say it again Ar noah's flood.com the flood. movie is titled uh, the ark in the darkness and yeah. it's going to be in 900 theaters nationwide uh, on march 20th and 21st and the movie website is noah's flood.com perfect well you ought to go out check that out bring your friends bring your enemies they probably need it worse uh, bring your kids your grandkids <laughs> and and if you don't have any go make some kids and bring them but more than <laughs> than anything you know thank you dan biddle for sort of fighting fighting the good fight uh brothers in christ uh, arm in arm uh the truth is um we're all of us as believers are on the journey. We're doing the best we can. If we're sincere, God will get us there, but we're going to be at different phases. And and maybe sometimes what we discover or believe is five years from now, you know? And so we got to have to give some grace and maybe judge people where they're going more than where they are because, you know, we've all gone through a lot of difficulty in life and it's hard. It's a We're in a fallen world and it's going to be very evil and painful. And let's try to sort of walk somebody through it. Uh, as long as they're sincere, uh, then uh, let's be humble enough to allow folks to disagree agreeably and with the hope and belief that God will bring them to the truth if that's what they're seeking. Folks, this is God's comic. Brad Stein never thought I'd be in this world of having these conversations with these types of folks. But it's my call. It's my mission. It's my purpose. It's my ministry. I didn't sign up for it. God sort of demanded it. And I've learned that if you disagree with God and decide not to follow through with his calling, you wake up on the beach in whale vomit enough times you start going, <laughs> I think I'm heading to Nineveh. So uh, you have a calling, a purpose. And if you don't know Jesus, that is the ultimate balancing uh, of your life to show you what is true north, what is actually true about life. And that's how you get there. So folks, jump in, enjoy the ride. If someone ever says you are politically incorrect, always thank them for the compliment because you do not ever want to live in a lie. You want to live in truth and that truth is revealed in the word of God. This is God's comic, Brad Stein. That was Dan Biddle. And I'm just doing what I always do, but what I do best, putting the woke back to sleep. See you next Monday.